everyone. Today, we'll talk about how you can take your database and uh, uh, get it from running into container to really very powerful, but fully open source database uh, as a service powered by Kubernetes. Now, let me start with uh, a bit of a history, or at least what my experience uh, has been with the infrastructure and open source uh, software. If you look at the early days of open source software, at least as uh, I uh, remember those, things have been uh, quite complicated. I remember in the early days uh, dealing with Linux and other uh, open source software, things have been quite uh, tricky. You would have to download the source code, find the proper compiler version, which compile uh, compiler of it, maybe apply some patches, compile lots of stuff yourself, and so on and so forth, right? Well, basically it was uh, quite uh, tricky. But uh, since that, we have uh, seen never ending move towards uh, simplicity as we are trying to be as much efficient as possible. And it is, of course, the simple things which drive such uh, efficiency. If you look at the path uh, we've taken, it went from downloading the sources, patching and compiling, to when we had uh, like tar GZ binaries and install script, which will simplify installation uh, uh, greater, but which will uh, create a problem of dependencies. Like you may install the binary, but it wouldn't have some libraries, so it would have incompatible libraries, right, and uh, not work properly. With that, we ended up to get in the packages with dependencies, such as them uh, and RPM, then simplifying that package download and installation with uh, apt uh, and uh, uh, yum repositories. Then the problem remains uh, is having multiple conflicting versions of a software at the same time. Many of software packages would share the same uh, paths, so you could not easily install multiple versions of the software uh, at the same time. With that, yet another uh, simplification developed, such so technologies as Docker and Snap, which allow to uh, avoid uh, those problems. And in this presentation, we will focus uh, on the Docker as I think by far uh, the uh, most common software on uh, of its kind. So what is about running database in Docker? How and why? Well, there are actually two uh, different ways or two different kind of environments where you can consider running your database in Docker. One of them is a test and prod, or test and dev, right? And in test and dev, uh, using uh, Docker to run your database is actually very common and very convenient. It is uh, wonderful because you can create many uh, components or many databases which are isolated from each other, right? For example, if you want to test your applications working in different database versions, well, you can deploy uh, multiple of them running at the same computer very conveniently. We have it without having to deal with uh, complicated installations of multiple versions at a time. If you look at the conversion, conventional MySQL installation, for example, in most Linux distribution, you cannot really have easily multiple versions installed at the same time, but you can easily have uh, that in Docker, which can be very handy. You can also use Docker Compose to simplify uh, the deployment of your database or whole uh, application with uh, Docker Compose, which can be uh, handy. Now, if you look at the production though, there are some problems and challenges. First is there are fears of overhead. I think they're mostly uh, unfounded uh, at this point. But indeed, early versions of Docker in some cases could uh, cause significant overhead, which was too much to pay uh, in production. 
The second problem, of course, is extra complexity you have to deal uh, with, right? You would uh, uh, very likely need to make sure, for example, to store data in a separate data volumes, right? And be very uh, uh, careful of uh, not, uh, you know, losing your database by uh, dropping uh, the container, which I think some something which, you know, beat in the uh, bad uh, number of people when they started to use Docker for the first time. Also, if you think about the monitoring and observability tools, many of them initially lacked uh, proper Docker support, which has uh, uh, additional, um, uh, additional overhead. Now, if you think about uh, state of uh, open source databases and Docker, you'll find what most open source databases have official Docker images up there. And they, in fact, are very commonly deployed for test and dev, but also have uh, relatively limited use in uh, production. I see very little people, in fact, saying, hey, you know what, we just use Docker to run our database uh, in uh, production. Typically it goes, either you are running your databases on VMs or bare metal, or you go all the way to the Kubernetes, which we'll talk about a little bit later. If you look at uh, Percona, uh, we also provide some solutions uh, in this space. We provide our Docker packages for MySQL and uh, uh, MongoDB and uh, Percona provided enhanced enterprise grade distribution, which is free and open source. Basically, what that means is we provide uh, uh, many uh, features which are only available in the enterprise uh, edition from respected, uh, respected vendors, but uh, as an open source uh, uh, edition. And uh, uh, let me just clarify something uh, here. What Percona provides is try to provide uh, open source mm, solution, but uh, their MongoDB itself changed the license to source available license a couple of years ago. So our Percona server for MongoDB, because of that is also server source available, rather than truly open source as we would uh, prefer. Now, what is unsolved problem? Unsolved problem with, uh, with Docker. Well, at large extent, it is uh, day two operations. Their Docker makes it very easy to provide the uh, provision with database. It doesn't really happen very well, managing high availability, upgrades, and so on and so forth. Yes, of course, you can go ahead and tear down your database and uh, and provide uh, the new one, but that is not really uh, how we operate a database at, at scale. Typically, we would have uh, the, in production the clusters provisioned, not the single servers, and then we do maintenance, upgrade, and so on and so forth. We want to do that in a rolling way, while cluster uh, remains highly available, even though some of it node goes down uh, 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 for maintenance. Docker itself is a single node solution, right? So it doesn't really mix it the cluster. And while there was a solution Docker Swarm, it did not really uh, get much, uh, uh, much traction. And in fact, does not really have a very good solution for uh, managing databases. What has those solutions instead is, uh, is a Kubernetes. Now, when I talk about uh, databases and uh, Kubernetes, uh, then some people are surprised. Though I would say less and less people are surprised uh, every, uh, every year. And indeed, Kubernetes and databases, they have kind of complicated uh, relationship because Kubernetes was designed for stateless applications. Right? And database is, well, very opposite of state, right? Database is typically where you can store your state so your application can uh, uh, be mm, a stateless, right? And with that kind of rallying cry for Kubernetes is, hey, you know, write your applications in a stateless way and run them on Kubernetes, uh, it's 
sounds almost like uh, anathema to uh, running database on Kubernetes. Well, things have improved and changed in, this, uh, in, uh, uh, in the recent years. As Kubernetes ecosystem matured, uh, the understanding times what there are a number of uh, stateful applications which we want to run on uh, Kubernetes, and database is an important part of them. There is actually a very active data on Kubernetes community, which is focused exactly at uh, that uh, problem year, which was uh, growing rapidly and uh, uh, getting um, a lot of uh, uh, success. Now, uh, if you uh, look at this case, even a few years ago, uh, uh, the, even some of the very experienced people in uh, Kubernetes, right, they're uh, not very uh, excited about running state for workloads uh, on Kubernetes. But I think things are changing. And I wonder what Casey would say uh, right now, right, three years after uh, he posted uh, this tweet. Now, in reality, we can see a lot of Kubernetes uh, adoption with a database technology. In fact, there is a, a pretty large amount of public uh, database uh, as a service solutions, which are powered by uh, Kubernetes. Cockroach Cloud, and PlugZV, PlanetScale, DataStrax Extra, uh, Altinity Cloud. Uh, uh, I also heard their Enterprise DB launched their, cl their uh, public cloud offering, which is also powered by Kubernetes. And what that means is what we are talking about tens or probably even hundreds of thousands of the database nodes uh, running uh, right now in Kubernetes uh, in production. So it is possible, and that, that works. Now, what is so exciting about uh, Kubernetes? Well, I think about the Kubernetes as an uh, operating system, but for your data center, right? And I think in this regard, it's kind of taken the path which is somewhat similar to what Linux uh, was, uh, uh, was having, right? If you remember early Linux days, it was kind of not very good operating system. I remember when Linux was not supporting files more than uh, uh, two gigabytes in size or was limited to four gigabytes because of, uh, you know, 42 bit system for 42 bit CPUs, right? People who worked with a real big iron were laughing at Linux. Well, but guess what? Uh, it's uh, improved to become pretty much uh, u uh, ubiquitous and, and the standard uh, operating system we work with. And I think uh, of Kubernetes in the same way, but providing us uh, the same experience for data center, right? Because distributed systems are different, their API and the kind of like a uh, mental concept what uh, Kubernetes provides is different from what we get used with Linux. So it can be hard for some people to get a, a grist of it at first, uh, right? But uh, at time, uh, uh, over time, it becomes very uh, one, uh, wonderful. Uh, I was explaining to some people uh, 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 what uh, Kubernetes is like beer. When you try a beer at first, right, it sort of uh, tastes bitter, right? But then you develop acquired taste and, you know, start uh, start loving it. What is great thing about the, the uh, Kubernetes is it has a very robust mechanics to deal with node failure, which is a very important for large scale uh, uh, distributed uh, system. And then what is also very helpful for databases specifically is in the new uh, versions of Kubernetes ecosystem have this operator framework, which really allows for automating a lot of complex database operation tasks, right? Uh, upgrades, uh, various maintenance operations, various self-healing from, uh, uh, from various kind of failures. All of those are not uh, not trivial, right? And 
uh, require some works, but which all can be implemented in that operator framework. Now, uh, the support of uh, Kubernetes by database vendors is kind of uh, interesting, which has a lot slower pickup uh, by vendors themselves. Uh, and I think this is because many of them want to steer you to their managed uh, hosting solution, right? If you look at how would Oracle, for example, want you to mm, consume MySQL in the cloud? Well, guess what? You just run Oracle Cloud, right? The same uh, goes for folks like uh, MariaDB, MongoDB with MongoDB Atlas, uh, and so on and so forth. And the fact there are actually many third-party Kubernetes solutions very developed. You would uh, often find multiple Kubernetes operators for MySQL, for Postgres, uh, right, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, and those uh, Kubernetes solutions actually can come in two parts. It could be either Helm charts or operator packages. And the Helm charts is something which uh, just helps with the installation. Their operators is typically more advanced and they provide a full lifecycle uh, management. In terms of Percona, we have solutions for our operators for MySQL, MongoDB, and, uh, uh, and Postgres, which you can install directly or install operator through uh, Helm chart. And uh, as we, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, that uh, provides improved uh, uh, enterprise grade uh, features. But I think if uh, uh, operators uh, we really go uh, much more than that, and uh, our operators provide uh, uh, many features which are even more robust or just simply non-existent in the uh, in the upstream, right? So, for example, if you really want uh, to have a very robust operator to run uh, MySQL. There is uh, really no match to Percona's uh, uh, operator in terms of functionality and to what extent it was uh, battle tested. The other thing which I love uh, with uh, operators is also it allows you to have the uh, software defined uh, infrastructure and have an infrastructure as a code. This, for example, uh, example is how you can define uh, their cluster configuration, right? Which tells you uh, everything what you want to uh, deploy, what kind of storage, how many nodes of uh, of what kind, right? And uh, uh, applying this as a uh, YAML file, right? You basically would get uh, always uh, the same uh, the, the same uh, 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 cluster, right? And if you want to change what you're deploying, you can, you know, change the YAML file and keep that in a version control, right? And I think that is uh, uh, the, this infrastructure as a code uh, concept is uh, supported by uh, operators uh, uniquely well. But so what are unsolved problems with Kubernetes itself? Well, there is, I think, uh, a mm, uh, couple of uh, uh, problems here. Now, if you are looking at uh, running business critical stateful application on Kubernetes, it is not really easy because there are many moving parts in Kubernetes and you have to figure out how to properly set, uh, set up your storage so it's uh, robust and has no single point of uh, failure and it's performant and it's secure and so on and so forth, right? You'll need to set up a backups uh, and the, all this kind of uh, stuff, right? Which is not easy for non uh, uh, non Kubernetes and, and experts, right? And another thing which uh, maybe not be easy is the API. As I mentioned, the API of a Kubernetes is uh, uh, different and it's more declarative than action driven. If you are somebody who you got used to the Linux uh, approach, right? It often goes as a step-by-step -step action. I download the package, I install it, I went for installation to complete, 
then I, mm, you know, go ahead and let's say create my, mm, you know, MySQL users, which I'm going to use, all this kind of stuff. Well, that is not how you really work with a Kubernetes. A Kubernetes uh, is a, a, a de declarative, right? And uh, uh, in uh, many cases, uh, it's uh, asynchronous, right? You sort of uh, deploy, say, hey, create me this environment, and you know, Kubernetes does its work, and eventually you get that environment in its state you you wanted, uh, uh, wanted provision, right? That can be slightly unexpected, confusing for people, and that requires kind of the different uh, mental work. Now, uh, if you want to learn uh, uh, if, uh, uh, how to use their uh, Kubernetes with their uh, data, uh, with uh, uh, MySQL, uh, I created this blog post, which includes a very uh, good uh, tutorial for uh, for Minikube, right? Which really gets you to go through their most important operations with, uh, uh, with the cluster. Okay. Now, in the start of this presentation, uh, we, st we talk about uh, simplicity, right? And let's think what is about the state of park simplicity of a database, especially databases in the cloud. And it is, not surprisingly, database uh, as, uh, as a service. When you think about the database as a service, we really have uh, multiple solutions, which all tends to be proprietary. First, all major cloud, and actually a number of uh, uh, you know, second tier cloud, uh, cloud those days, they have their own proprietary database as a service offer. And what I mean in this case, uh, where the database itself may be open source, as with uh, Amazon RDS, MySQL, or maybe proprietary, right? Uh, uh, if it is uh, Amazon Aurora or uh, Google Spanner, in the end, it is wrapped around the proprietary management code and API, right? Which offers you very different, uh, uh, different experience compared to their uh, open source uh, uh, component alone, right? That is why I call that as a uh, property. Because if you move from a cloud and say, hey, I, I want just to run it now on-prem, well, guess what? You would not be able to use the same nice GUI you're able to provision the database with, uh, as you can with uh, Amazon RDS, for example. Now, database vendors, also tend to have their own proprietary solution. You think about MongoDB Atlas, SkySQL, Cockroach Cloud, and so on and so forth, right? Well, all of them have the same thing, just from uh, uh, their own side. And then also there is uh, the new generation popping up of a uh, multi-vendor, multi-cloud solutions such as Avian and InstaCluster, which again have their proprietary management uh, layer over uh, open source uh, database. And those companies often would uh, state how wonderful open source is and so on and so forth, right? But uh, in the end, uh, the solution is still more partly uh, proprietary, especially when it comes to management level. Database as a service is uh, actually fantastic. It's remove uh, provides a lot of benefits also from uh, removing toil, right? Which uh, so stands for uh, activities which are not particularly productive for uh, your system, right? Managing availability, database patching, backups, performance tuning, right? Uh, database servers make database easy to scale where in most cases you can just, you know, say, hey, go to their uh, larger instance size, right? Well, scaling by the credit card is uh, very easy with, uh, with database uh, as a service. They also are often uh, open source compatible. But open source compatible in uh, uh, the database service way is typically saying, hey, if it is, you're using open source database, it's easy for you to move to our solution 
right? And then we'll provide you that kind of extra value, which is not available in the open source package itself. So it would be very hard for you to move back to a properly open source uh, solution. So be careful with that. What you also see is what the database as a service, especially when it comes to their uh, major um, cloud, they tend to be over marketed, right? They are often stated as fully managed database as a service where people may say, oh, great. That means I don't need any database experts on staff. Uh, uh, Amazon will just take everything, just do everything for me. Well, uh, then you turn around uh, and here, well, actually a lot of things are shared responsibility, right? Amazon Aurora is not going to at least yet automatically design your application queries, your schema, your indexes and so on and so forth, right? So you have to know what that uh, uh, fully uh, managed means. And typically that does not mean what you can avoid having any database uh, uh, experts on, uh, on your team. And also uh, we have an issue of potential database uh, as a server uh, vendor locking. As I mentioned, that is uh, uh, their uh, game what everybody uh, plays uh, in this market is to make sure what you are so much relying on database and the service solution you uh, would be pressed hard to uh, to uh, uh, to run just open source solution and what is interesting in this case is what the price differential between the hardware right or infrastructure uh, right in the cloud it costs to run a database as a service and then uh, the, uh, how much it uh, costs to run that database as a service venture, uh, the cost uh, differential for that is continue, uh, is, uh, uh, continue to grow, right? Being uh, more and more. I remember in initial release, uh, for example, uh, RDS, uh, uh, they're charging about 40% surcharge for their kind of convenience management layer. And uh, in the uh, latest generations, especially with uh, Graviton, it's uh, more like 2X. Now, I think that is also where we can uh, learn uh, the lesson from, from the past. And if you are uh, wondering who is uh, that uh, good looking guy here uh, on, the pay, uh, on their picture, this is Jan Larry Ellison from uh, Oracle who was uh, initially saving folks with Oracle from the hardware vendor lock-in of IBM, right? Who was uh, requiring you to run everything on those, uh, you know, huge uh, mainframe computers. But guess what? After folks have been sufficiently locked in the Oracle database, uh, they have been on never ending journey of uh, raising prices. Uh, right, and uh, 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 now there is a saying goes about Oracle, what Oracle doesn't have hostage, uh, customers, Oracle has hostages, right? How things change. And I think that is uh, 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 something that you have to be very mindful of uh, locking in with other technologies mm -hmm. and specifically in the cloud. I believe cloud is in a very interesting stage right now. We kind of have a two ways uh, to run things uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the cloud. Either we can go in and completely uh, drink a vendor Kool-Aid and lock in, for example, with Amazon or other proprietary cloud vendor and you know use all of that highly differentiated, very cool, but very proprietary uh, solutions. And then, well, we are completely at uh, Amazon Mercy, or we can go with solutions from cloud native computing uh, foundation, right? Which offers now a lot of open source solutions and which treats uh, cloud as commodity. Cloud is great. You still are very likely to run a lot of your application uh, in the cloud over the next few years, but there are multiple ways mm, uh, you can do that. I would also point out that is something what Amazon themselves 
uh, recommended. Here's that. That is exactly slide from their presentation, which uh, compared cloud computing to electricity. Of course, for most of us in most environments, it doesn't make sense to run our own generator all the time, right? It makes sense to buy generation from utility. But the thing about electricity is it is commodity. You can change your utility provider and still keep your TV, your fridge, uh, the, your laptop, right? Well, that is something what cloud tries to take away from us and say, well, you know, guys, if you are buying uh, this fantastic TV, but guess what? It only works if you uh, run, buy electricity from us. Not a very good situation. So again, uh, Kubernetes is fantastic solution in this case because it provides a universal API which works both in public and, uh, and private cloud. If you run Amazon, you can use Kubernetes. If you uh, use Google, Azure, or your on-prem solutions, uh, Kubernetes support uh, all of them. And we believe what you can use that uh, uh, API to provide database as a service like experience, which works in the public and uh, uh, private cloud. At Pircona, that is a work in progress. There are our uh, operators are uh, very robust and we have uh, a lot of deployments uh, for our operators and Kubernetes in very mission critical environments. Our database service is currently in uh, uh, work in progress. It's uh, experimental, right? But we would encourage you to uh, check it out, which you do by downloading PMM, give us some feedback and also, hey, it is open source. If you don't like it, you can fix it and uh, uh, send us uh, uh, a pull request. So we are seen in generally as use of uh, uh, open source uh, uh, database as a service uh, in uh, uh, kind of uh, from two uh, angles. From one standpoint is the interface, right? Where developers say, hey, I want to make sure I have a single API call and just provide the cluster, which is self-healing, self-patching, self-tuning, and so on and so forth. And that is something which uh, we can provide as an open source package. Then if you are looking at the fully managed solution, well, that is uh, uh, there you actually need people to deal with some of the database problems because even if software gets better and better, it cannot solve uh, everything. And that is something where you have to do it yourself or uh, uh, work with a partner. And if you recall, our uh, vision is what we, in, uh, we pre create the open source software. So you can do it yourself. You can uh, uh, work with partners, uh, right? And uh, Pircona would be uh, one of such companies which you could uh, hire to run uh, their uh, open uh, source uh, software. So if you look uh, at, uh, uh, at the summary, the takeaway. First, the open source databases are really on the path from support of containers, which is very robust and have been there for years, to really having full open source databases as a service experience. The trick of open source database experience, though, is that is something for us to build because many of the database as a service vendors, especially when those are uh, sort of like an enterprise open source of single vendor, like in MySQL, like MySQL, for example, uh, uh, they have sort of other uh, uh, proprietary database service solutions, right, which are in competition with this uh, ideology. So Docker support, as we discussed, is quite mature. Uh, Kubernetes support is getting, uh, getting there. Uh, as I mentioned, we are seeing thousands and thousands of uh, nodes and database clusters uh, running on, on Kubernetes. Their fully open source database experience is still work in progress right now. So as it goes with open source, 
you can be part of the solution and we encourage you uh, to do that. To finish it up, I believe a database as a service really has won hearts and minds of developers because it just offers unparalleled convenience of uh, uh, using uh, uh, the database. Software vendor locking mm, sucks. And as uh, many times before, the open source is uh, coming uh, to rescue. That's uh, all I uh, have to say. And here are some links uh, if you uh, uh, would like to connect. Thank you.